Welcome to Moss Marketing Monday, a.k.a. the M3 Podcast, brought to you by Moss Marketing Group, bringing you everything marketing every Monday. Stay tuned for marketing tips and tricks you can use today. The M3 Podcast, marketing knowledge to help you succeed. Let's get started. Welcome back to the M3 Podcast. This week, we got Dre on, we got Ricky on, and we got Brock on. Dre and Ricky from the MMG crew. And Brock, you are not from the MMG crew. I'm not. Oof. But from the real estate world. Sure am. So we uh, there's a lot of people that come on here that I've been friends with for a long time. Uh, we do business together, all kinds of different things. And you are someone that I ended up connecting with through... Madison, actually, and yep. our, uh, our wives connected first. Yeah. Social media is a wonderful thing. It is. It's crazy. <laughs> crazy <world. laughs> but it's funny when, so we went to dinner, went, went down to Graham and Dunn and I'll be honest, a lot of times Madison will run into people or females that she becomes friends with. And she's like, we need to go to dinner with these people. And she'll be like, their, their husband's coming. I'd say like nine out of 10 times. I don't really get along. Like, it's fine, but it's like, I don't look to like, yeah, seek out hanging out with them again. Mm -hmm. I can relate. And, uh, so I was like, okay. I was like, I'll go. But I was like, it is what it is. And I think what we went to, you are. The what? <laughs> what a giver you are. Yeah. I'll go I'll look like my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should feel honored. Yeah. You, yeah. But it's like, I don't know. I just really don't like jive a lot of times with like everyone. And it's like, it was one of those things that, I feel like we hit it off that night, like, yeah, just to a T. And I know we're both super busy, so it wasn't like the next day we were hanging out, but yeah, it was something that I knew the it was the next, some, next day, though. The next, next yeah. day, the day so, after that, yeah, yeah. But I knew it was like when we crossed paths, I'm like, that's somebody like I'll be friends with. It. Well, I appreciate that. Feelings mutual for sure. You know, Ashley and I really enjoy you guys and feel like we'll be friends for a while. So, yeah. So, real estate. It was it was something that it's kind of unusual that I go to dinner with somebody and then like the the guy per se is somebody that knows so much about real estate that like you and Madison just have a, a very common knowledge of what you guys are doing. What what got you into real estate? So um, Ashley, my wife, actually was working for Eric um, as a transaction coordinator. I graduated. So Eric Eric is. We, uh, I'm on the Eric Craig real estate team. So I was, um, I was poor at intro introducing that correctly. So that was my fault. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm on, I'm on the Eric Craig real estate team, uh, office up in Smithville service, the whole Kansas city area. Um, I was in college, uh, finishing college up in 2018. My wife was working for Eric, um, graduated college and got my degree in nutrition and exercise physiology. Uh, found out very quickly I was either going to go into kinesiology for a master's and, and pursue physical therapy, um, which I really didn't want to do because I was done with school <laughs> and, and wanted to make some money. Uh, and turns out it's it's hard to make money <laughs> with that degree. Uh, and so graduated. Ashley and I moved in together right away, racked up some bills. I was personal training at Genesis Health Clubs from four in the morning until two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then I'd go home, I'd shower, and then I'd go work at Pizza Shop up in Platte City. From ironic, four ironic combo. Right, yeah. yeah. They, like, they mesh guys well, like, don't they? How's that guy not more fit? Well, I think he works at the Pizza Shop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, the tight gym shirt was not uh, super flattering <laughs> at the time. Uh, obviously, I was eating for free because we were poor. Um, but getting home at 11, sleeping for a few hours and doing it all over again. Um, did that for a couple months. Eric had a party at his house. Um, him and I got into some drinks and, um, I saw what his life was like and what, you know, the team was doing and offered to work for him for free. If he would just train me for six months, I told him I'd do whatever I needed to do, um, get some free training and then go off on my own. And uh, got hired the next day, got my license, and now we're here. 
Game over. Podcast is over. Yep. How's that? Now we're here. I'm just glad you uh, trained first and then went to the pizza place so that you didn't smell like pizza when you were training everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, I might have smelled like pizza the next morning. <laughs> it's leftover pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you would, if you would put that whole combo together at Plant Fitness, game over. Oh, dude. You would have been on. You know, I had their business model figured out <laughs> yeah. and I didn't even know it. Yeah. You could have been you could have been competing with Plant Fitness <laughs> on national level overnight. It was horrible. You see some of your clients come in late at night, though? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, they hey. walk in, see me, and then they walk right back out. <laughs> I'm undercover, guys. Get yeah. out. Yeah. Undercover trainer. You could have had a whole whole skit with that. I could have picked oh, that so many other restaurants to go work <laughs> at that would have made more sense, but yeah. no. <laughs> so when you get into real estate, I know that we talked about it like right out the gate. And when Madison was like, yeah, Brock's in real estate. I'm like, well, there's a lot of shitty real estate agents out there. So I'm like, I'll, most of the time. Odds are. Odds are most of the time they're not very impressive real estate people. <laughs> But you're like knowledge, like I have respect for good real estate individuals, like, and it's, it becomes rare and rare to find. And it was some, like, what was it like when you got into that, that you like just grasp, like, that was like, you picked it up. Um, for me, it was kind of, I mean, it was probably a couple things, a certain extent, sort of just like sink or swim. Like I was either going to figure it out and we were going to pay rent in utilities or I wasn't, and we were going to move back in with my parents, um, which I was never going to accept. Um, so I shadowed Eric, um, and Andrea, who's the other owner of our team a lot. Um, and between them, they probably had 45 years of combined experience. Um, two of the best in the business, in my opinion. Um, so I learned quick, um, and was super lucky to, to be under them. Um, I had some construction knowledge. I painted new construction, um, at Mizzou to help pay for school. So was kind of around real estate and, um, in new developments and things of that nature. So the, the background of that was sort of familiar to me. Um, but honestly, just learning from them, um, was super helpful. How important do you think it is? Because, I talk with a lot of people on, especially younger, I'm going to say younger is like under 30 and even in in the thirties, younger business professionals that a lot of times I think mentorship for a long time, I I, I didn't want to accept that I needed help. Yeah. I didn't want to, I want to think that like I can learn everything on my, my own. I can read more books. I can do all this, all these different things, but it's amazing when I started looking for like mentorship and other people that we're making it happen that they could look at something and they could give me like key takeaways so quickly that would make a difference. And I also think we live in a world now that there's so much noise and there's so much like bullshit mentorship. Mm-hmm. So it's like, everybody's a coach. Yeah. And it's like, I think there's a lot of people that need help with just like thinking bigger. And it's like, and that was a hard thing. It's like, I, we, we tried starting like a marketing coaching deal and then it was like, I figured out like most of these people aren't even at the point that they need help with marketing yet. It's just thinking that it's possible. Yeah. So it's like, what was, what that mentorship look like from Eric? Like when you started and I, I'm going to say that not even seeing the whole thing, I know it's crazy important. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, certainly I, I can relate to your point of, you know, being a little bit hard headed, young, wanting to do it on my own. Um, I think our dynamic worked really well because Eric and Andrea were so busy. I mean, Eric at the time was probably selling 120 houses a year, just him. Andrea was probably selling 80 houses a year, just her. And so there was never really a time where it felt like they were like lecturing me or talking down to me. Like we never sat down and reviewed after a appointment. I just went on the appointment with them. I would have to grab them. I mean, they're flying out the door, you know, going to appointments and and I'm just asking, Hey, can I tag along? I'll stay out of the way. And so there was really no one-on-one mentoring necessarily. It was just watch and learn kind of, um, which was probably fitting for my personality. Um, I mean, when I had questions I would ask, um, 
but really it was just kind of tagging along, taking notes, making mental notes and, and then going in and copying that in my own business. So. And I think where a lot of real estate agents struggle is they've never seen the volume of transactions. Yeah. I think that's where you learn in real estate is seeing the volume of the movement where I look at even Madison now, like where she's at from where she began, like she doesn't have to make calls to like figure something out. She's had it happen in, a, in another transaction. She's seen something that was similar. She can connect the dots. She, she knows how to solve bigger problems. Mm-hmm. I think so many like new agents don't know how to solve like, because when you get your license, it's the same thing. You get a mortgage license. They don't teach you how to actually do home loans. <laughs> they teach you about all the regulations, all the bullshit. Uh, you get all up. the laws and then it's like, <laughs> yeah. you step in the office, it's like <clears throat> well, completely different. What, what <laughs> yeah, do we do here? It's, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. It, so I think seeing probably that volume right out of the gate and there's, we also talk about it all the time. There's people that can have all the knowledge in the world, but if they don't understand how to take action with it, then it's, I look at it as it's useless. Like I probably did that backwards. Yeah. I just jumped in. I mean, they, they did actually one day Andrea asked me, how do you learn? How do you want to be trained? And I was, I just asked her to throw me into the fire. I I didn't want to, I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to take time. The day I got my license in the mail, I sold a house. Like literally as soon as it was legal for me, I sold a house that day. Um, and had I not been thrown into the fire and shadowing with them, I I don't think I probably would have. Um, how was that first sale? Uh, it was awesome. (laughs) It was awesome. I, uh, I did an open house and this, uh, super nice lady walked in, um, told me what she was looking for. And we had a few of them for sale at the time that matched that criteria in Smithville. I closed down the open house, went and showed her the properties and she bought one of them that night. So I was freaking out because to your point, I didn't know how to write a contract. (laughs) I didn't know. I mean, I was like, I know what I'm not supposed to do legally, but I don't know what I need to do. So I had help writing up the contract. I mean, I got drugged through that transaction and, and, uh, I think hopefully she had a good experience and (laughs) just kind of snowballed from there. I'm just picturing Eric on the other. It's like, I got one on the hook and they're like, "Mm -hmm." yeah, it's your first day. They were pissed at me. (laughs) Everyone was real pissed. They were like, it is not this easy. Like <laughs> you, you are not allowed to have this, this sale on your first day. You can't, you're, you can't do it. The other thing it's too, gonna mess you up. Yeah. yeah. And it did. I, I had poor expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, shit, I'll just do open houses. It's yeah. easy. Yeah. Why, why isn't everyone just going to sell yeah. a house a day? Yeah. yeah. No problem. No, but I also think the first time that we met, I could tell that you carry an energy level that like energy, I think in like sales is one of the most important things that people gravitate to energy. And I've been into open houses that I'm like, I will, I would bet everything I own that the agent in there is not going to sell them. Yeah. Like, no, they're sitting there and they're rude as hell to people coming in. They're like, they're like so annoyed with everything that's going on. And it's like, they literally just got there, unlock the door. They're sitting there and like, we've been into open houses that are a million plus dollars. And you go into a million plus dollar house and the agent just like looks at you and just like looks away and like ignores you. Yeah. Either that or, or an even worse alternative, in my opinion, they read the textbook on how to hold open houses and you walk through the door and they want your information and leave me your phone number so I can blow your phone up and all the things. And yeah, just talk to them. I mean, yeah, but I do think that get is, to know them. I do think that is a misconception and I, on the coast. I think there's a lot younger demographic coming into a lot more expensive purchasing power and i think in the midwest it's still typically older individuals buying some of that higher dollar real estate so Agreed. then like younger people do get looked at different when they come in they're like yeah they're not buying probably so yeah when, when i bought my house mass and i came through and we've been looking at houses for three four months and like we started off and we're like we're gonna we're gonna buy a fixer upper I was working all, like, all your spare time. I was working like six days a week <laughs> yeah. at the dealership. We're cleaning the dealership on Sundays, cleaning cars at night. And Madison's like, when are you going to do that? Cause I'm, I'm pretty handy. And, uh, I was like, no, but I was like, that's what all investment people say is like buy a fixer up or flip it. Then you, you do it on the Knicks house. You compound all this money. Mm-hmm. And I was like, house and, hack. Yeah. Like complete dipshit when I was, what I was doing. Have but, you watched a YouTube video yeah. yet? <laughs> so, Mass is like, we're going to get into all this. And she goes, you are literally like never going to own it a second of your time. So then, and I was just, I also have misconception. The crazy thing is with our dad being in home loans forever, I thought my house payment was going to be like crazy high. Mm-hmm. And then after I, 
my dad, uh, I told Mass, I was like, I'm going to go get a pre approval and everything. I, I get a pre approval. I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, this is what the payment would be. And like, rates were solid at the time. So I was like, I, I we can, I easily handle that. I'm like, yeah. So they give me a pre approval for like twice what our house is. And so we go out, start looking. I'm 22 years old at the time. And they have three, all three of these brand new houses were sitting here. And I go pulling up to the model. And I told Mass, I was like, I'm going to make an offer on it. I was like, I know how I'm structuring the whole deal. And I walk in there and there's like this older couple and we're kind of walking around. No one's giving us time to go. Yeah. Granted, I'm going to cut off like jeans, cowboy boots. <laughs> Mass is wearing a hat. says too blessed. To, too blessed to something on it. And I was like, too blessed to be stressed. And I'm like, they're looking at us. Like, I can't imagine why they didn't get yeah. this time. Yeah. Yeah. So they're like yeah. nine and looking at us. And I'm like, uh, can I make an offer on one of your houses? And the lady looks at me like, I had, your pre approval? Literally, like, I <laughs> yeah. had five minutes. She goes, You need to get pre approved first. I was like, I have a pre approval. She's like, Do you know how much the houses are? I'm like, Yeah, my pre approval is for twice as much as the house. And she's like, Oh. And then these two people are sitting. She's like, Can you guys get up? Like, <laughs> oh, she <geez. laughs> like, kicks these people. I sit down. I make look like, at them and like you guys need to get a pre approval. Yeah, go get your guys. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you guys should yeah. get in line. <laughs> yeah, see what kind of power that's got here. <laughs> <laughs> and within 15 minutes, we had an offer signed and everything on the house. Oh my god! And but it was just it's funny how like it was just discounted so much that I tell Madison all the time. I was like, never judge a book by its cover. And no. She's had so many people reach out that we like went to show the first time, and I'm like. And they, they buy a million dollar house and they're like, oh yeah, we can just, we can pull from over here and pay cash for it and everything. I'm like, you, you just never know what people yeah. have. No. And I mean, we're, we're going through the largest wealth transfer in the history of the United States. I mean, trillions of dollars are, are being passed down. And I mean, you'd be shocked how many clients I have who are even 40 years old, whose parents are giving them half million, million dollars cash paying for the house and then, you know, kids are paying them back down yeah. the road. I mean, it's, it is crazy how much cash is out there. Yeah. Madison's had multiple clients with it's people in their mid thirties to forties and they're like, yeah, rates are high. So our parents are just going to give us the money to pay for it. And then we're just going to, we're just going to pay it back to them. Yep. And I'm just like, I think I'm you like have a big lot of, dollar amounts. I think you have a lot of people move from coast here. They're like, we can get how much? Yeah. Oh for my our gosh. Dollars? Dude. It is nuts when they come here that, oh my gosh, I, I feel like I'm Superman because, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm showing them, you know, they want a house on a little bit of land or something. And, you know, because they're so used to being cramped yeah. wherever that usually California, a lot of Cal, you know, a lot of people moving here from California. One point seven million dollar shack. Yeah. 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 And I had a guy who uh, a few months ago, they were selling like a two or three million dollar house in California. It was like a two bed, one bath with an ocean view. Um, and we were just looking at, I think, million dollar properties for him here. And I mean, he loved me. Every house I took him to, it was yeah. awesome. It was easy. Yeah. Madison most of the time has to like tell him not to make an offer on the first one that they yeah. see. Because she took him into like a, she had clients come out of California and they were looking at a $1.7 million house. And they go in, they're like, we get crown molding at this price point. <laughs> Oh my God. She's like, so your price starts seeing about four or five hundred thousand. They're like, what? And Lou, they call their kids like, you guys need to come here. And the oh kids build a one point four million dollar house across the street. Oh my! And she gosh. gets like both those deals, and then the guy's like, what kind of like rentals can I buy around here? And she goes and shows them like first two hundred thousand dollar rental, sells my like eighteen of them. Holy cow! And it was just like he's like, I don't even need to go look at them. He goes, you just tell me the area when they pop up. If you tell me it's a decent house, I'll just ride a check and I'll, buy, I'll take them. I was like, got the deal off Instagram. Are you serious? Yep. God, social media works again. The wife, the wife <laughs> need had to followed, get good at that stuff. The <laughs> wife had followed her for like over a year on Instagram. You know a good marketing company? No, actually I don't. <laughs> Would you look at that? <laughs> Can't say it's pretty underserved in the marketing space. Yeah. Somebody should open something like that. Until the last three years, I've yeah. been told. <laughs> I'd say probably until about the last six months. <laughs> <laughs> Is that three years was a stretch? Yeah. Three years ago, I don't know if we were making it happen. <laughs> but what would you say the the hardest thing to pick up in real estate was? like, Because when you get into real estate, I mean, you're 100% control of your own time. Yep. 100% so. control of your own time. 
hundred percent commission based, nothing's guaranteed. Um, I would say, I mean, the hardest thing for me was just getting started and gaining momentum. Um, you know, there were times when you had to pick up the phone and cold call and, you know, dial a thousand numbers a day to, to get business going. Um, thankfully I haven't had to do that for a while. Um, but I, I wouldn't trade it. I mean, that experience was humbling. And uh, as soon as you get that momentum and start getting repeat business from from those clients, uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll never want to go back. <laughs> Which I think that's also a testament to how you do business. Because I look at it as in any business you're in, if, if it's a service style business, if you get referrals and you get repeats, then that means you're doing something right. And I see a lot of agents that sell homes one time and then they never get that client again. Yeah. And then most they're of the transactional. time, most of the time they're pissed off at the client. And I'm like, and it's crazy. You'll talk to agents that like are on the, the low end and like, nobody's loyal nowadays, blah, blah, industry's jack. And I'm like, you're making a lot of excuses. Guess what? The only way you're going to fix that, all your problems lie with one person. It's the person you look at in the mirror. Yep. And like, actually that's not true. Millennials are proven to be the most loyal generation of any generation ever. Yeah. When I talk about Madison, I look at the like top 5% of real estate. There's plenty of it to go around. Mm -hmm. Like the top 5% all do really well all the time. Like they all keep their momentum's there. They get the repeat. Like I look at it more so as like that top 5% needs to take more out of that 50% that I would way rather if somebody came off the street, go you use you than some Joe Blow mm -hmm. that is like, oh yeah, I do this part time in the evenings once in a while. And then it's like, I can't get a house under contract. And Mass has had so many times where somebody's like came her way and they're like, we've been looking at a house for over 12 months. And they're like, well, our agent can just never go look at houses during the week because they're working. It's I'm like, horrible. that's a disservice to <clears throat> the person purchasing the home. Well, then like, people, it's bad for the industry. It yeah. makes it so people don't want to buy again. They're like, dude, a house buying process sucks. Yeah. When it doesn't have to be. It no. should be fun. It's like, hey, I'm getting a, you, you're getting a new house. Yeah. Should yeah. be exciting. It's kind of, I mean, they deal. should be kicking their feet up, having fun looking at houses. And I mean, all the behind the scenes work and the, the not so fun part is, is on the agent. I mean, the client should never have that experience. No, it's, I think it's happening more and more yeah. because I think the, the point of entry is so low yeah. for real estate that I think it should be 10 times higher. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I took that test in 20 minutes and, yeah. and passed and was out the door, studied for half a night. And I mean, yeah. it was beyond easy. Hey, MLO, MLO test is pretty hard to get your license as a, a, a low. Yeah. I don't think that's what it's called though. I, I think you messed, messed that up. I, I tell, know. tell me in the comments yeah. what it's called. It's not that, <laughs> but I mean, we picked up our mortgage license. It's, that is a little bit more intense. Like you have to do like 20 hours of recorded online, like studying yep. before you go take tests and you can take it three times. And if you fail it three times, you have to wait six months, yep. which we did in COVID just because we had time. And Found then out like, more people fail that than the bar each year. I believe it. I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> yeah. I also just, I think when people like go take the bar, most of the time they're pretty well prepared. Yeah, I feel like, like when, I feel like when people are taking the mortgage <laughs> test, like right, this can't be that hard. And I showed up, and I'm like, "Dang, this is pretty fucking hard." It's a it's a 128 questions. They're never the same. Yeah, and then you never know what you got wrong. And it's yeah. a pass or fail. Oh my god! First time I go they in, they give you a like, pass or fail on a percentage. That's it. Yeah, the percentage. I think I was one point off of passing. I'm like, Bruh. he didn't pass his first one. I guess. <laughs> There's like five of us that were all doing it. And then you have like, to wait 30 days to take it again. There's literally like five of us that all go take it at the same time that my dad was like, he's like, all oh, you guys grab your like mortgage license or whatever. Then he's like, everyone can just broker deals and then they get 25% a piece off of it. So it was like kind of a smart deal to do at the time. And then, yep. So I was like, I mean, I ain't doing nothing else. COVID, I'm sitting at home yeah. drinking beer in the driveway at noon every day. So I was like, it was yeah. not. <laughs> I would go to the gym and then I'd come home and spend like an hour and a half on like studying. And then I'm like, time party in the driveway. Yep. <laughs> and so I, I was literally the only one that passed it the first time. But man, it was uh Yeah, Dane's like, oh, you failed it? I'm like, dude. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> don't, don't even. Yeah. I don't need to hear it. <laughs> but 
So from the beginning of real estate, like when you come in mm -hmm. till now, what would you say like the biggest difference is like on how you run and operate business? And also how long has that been? I don't know if we threw that. I feel like it's that. not as long as we think. So I've been doing it for six years. Um, and what was the question again? I don't even remember. <laughs> What what has like changed the most from like business wise from when you started till now? I would just say uh, how I conduct myself around my sphere of influence. So you know, most of my business comes from people I know. Um, when you're first getting started, I mean, especially starting at 23 years old, you know, most of your friends at that age are not buying houses. They can't. So you're trying to earn their parents business, you're trying to service leads. Um, and you're young, obviously, you're probably coming off, not super experienced. And I was probably trying to be somebody I wasn't um, in order to, you know, forcefully gain that trust, which was not the right thing to do. Um, so honestly, I think just knowing the market, being knowledgeable, being a professional, and making, you know, the people around me feel confident and, and, and trust me, um, just conducting myself as a business, because I mean, I am in real estate, your, your own business. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that's changed. Um, along with, like you said earlier, just constantly staying in contact and taking care of your people and following up. Um, that's certainly the biggest difference. I also think a lot of times I see it in, I mean, I see it in marketing for, I mean, still at the highest scale is when you're networking with people, when you're making relationships, I look at it as just like, how do I make friends? Like, I don't need to sell anybody. Yep. And I think there's a lot of real estate agents out there that like just want to spew out like everything that they know, thinking that they're like, they sound like the smartest person in the room. And it's when you have like high level buyers, when you have like, Buyers can read like really quickly if you know what you're doing if you or if you don't. And you sit in there like spewing shit out of a book, just like one thing after another. Like I think it comes off in the wrong demeanor. Well, and how and how can you help? If you're the one talking the whole time, you're not gonna know what your clients' goals are. You're not gonna know what their personality's like. And and so then how do you know how to tailor, you know, the service to to help them? Um, so I mean, I hardly talk. I, I ask questions and, and I listen, um, which works for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd prefer to not talk. But it's like, <laughs> I feel like when you're doing that, you figure out what the, the wants, the needs are. And it's like, you can really actually iron out because I think a lot of people, we understood in the car space a lot also. People thought selling cars was hard. Like selling cars is actually really easy if you listen to people. Yeah, I'm sure. Like most people will come in and you have to understand what the difference between wants and needs are too. And it's the same thing on homes. Like that was something that I worked with Madison for quite a while on. Like when she first got into it, I was like, understand what wants and needs are and understand how to make, like pick them apart where people would come in. They always like wanted all these different things on a vehicle. And like, I remember having a, a family come in. They looked at six edges that day before they got to us. They had two kids that were about to have their third and they were all in car seats. You in think, an edge. You think three car seats are going to fit in an edge? But it's like they wanted an edge. Right. And they, they came in and I, I told them, I was like, I'm not selling you an edge. And they're like, no, that's what we want. They're like, you guys have two of them. We've went and looked at all these other ones. I was like, if I sell you an edge, I'm going to see you guys here again in three to four months. Mm -hmm. I was like, then you're going to have some negative equity. Like, you're not going to buy a vehicle and then have positive equity in three or four months. I promise you that. So I'm like, I'm going to see you guys here really soon. And then you're going to have to buy a car that's bigger because I'm like, let's grab those two car seats that are in your current car. I'm like, no, that's a lot of work. And I'm like, no, let's get those out. Let's get them in there. Let's see what kind of space we got. Mm -hmm. We got everything set up in this edge and every, and I'm like, it's not going to work. Yeah. I'm surprised the two car seats fit. So I pulled up and <laughs> yeah, we had like a flex. Sitting up on the steering wheel. <laughs> we had a flex and we had an expedition and the expedition was more money. The flex was similar on money. And I was like, so I pulled up. I'm like, this year's the same budget but it's going to have a lot more room in it. I was mm -hmm. like, this here's a little bit more, but it's going to be a bigger also, probably more convenient for the car seats. We went and drove all of them and they're like, we really appreciate that you listen to our budget also. Yeah. That a lot of dealers will just try to stack someone up real quick on money. Yep. I was like, I want to give you the option, but it's your guys' choice. 
and they ended up buying the flex and they came back probably six, seven months later, I see a car pulling everything. And the husband comes in and goes, I just really appreciate that you listened to us. Oh, that's cool. When we were buying our vehicle. He's like, we love it. And it was like, but I knew the difference between wants and needs. Yeah. It's the same thing on homes that like you see people all the time. You have a family in there that they're trying to justify every way to make that house work, just to try to pull the trigger on something fast. Yep. That's like, find the right thing. Because when you do the right thing, then you're going to earn that business for life, not just for that one deal. Yep, certainly. Yeah. In our in our consultations, our upfront um, consultation meetings, we'll usually have them, you know, usually husband and wife, let's say, um, sit down, write down three needs that they can agree on and then six wants. Um, and we'll usually say, yeah, we, we'll get you the three needs. We'll guarantee the three needs as long as it's realistic. And then we can get you about half of your wants most of the time. Yeah. Um, and, and go from there. But I think, you know, sitting them down and, and making them actually think through what the actual need is, like what is non-negotiable, uh, certainly helps. I mean, especially in that situation, yeah. luckily you thought for yeah. them, but. But it's a lot of times it, it narrows down the pool too of what they're looking at. Because if you have a buyer that's looking at, you see it with new agents all the time, they have a buyer that's looking at $200,000 houses and they're showing them like six to eight a day. Mm-hmm. And they're, they have like one buyer and then they're like, boy, I don't know how to survive in this industry. I'm like, it's because you're not doing your job up front. Yeah. That Madison won't go show houses to people. She's like, uh, it has this, this, this. You told me you guys do not want that. Yep. We're not looking at that house. No. Like, it's wasting my time. It's wasting your guys' time. Like, it. she goes, there's an open house on Saturday if you guys want to go zip through it. Yeah, it just leads to burnout and frustration. And yeah. it's not beneficial for anyone. So I think that's the ability, to to control buyers and... There's a lot of times I think in real estate, people don't control their buyers, that their buyers just control them. They just run them ragged and then they get burnt out. Yeah. I mean, they're just, I mean, a lot of people are just praying that they get a sale so they can pay their bills. These people are coming to you, trusting you to help navigate them through the largest transaction in their life. Yeah. And you can be an 18 year old kid out of high school and know nothing and have your license and and hook one of those people, which is just frightening. It, It is. It, Kind of baffling, a little. and it's. Yeah. Uh, I think that's where the whole deal is can come with the problem with the uh, um, commission structure and everything, which I think there's a, a large portion of agents out there that 100 percent deserve what they get, mm-hmm. no questions asked. They're yeah. great at their craft, but I think there's 50 percent of agents that don't deserve a percent. Oh my gosh, like even close. No. And yeah, I mean. Yeah, I won't even get into that, but yes. <laughs> because I, I, I realistically, I think the the car industry with sales forefront on that, I think real estate, I think it's all very similar. And I think the, I mean, the point of entry to auto sales, I mean, 18 years old, you can walk on and go sell cars. You're helping somebody with their second largest investment most of the time. But you have a pulse? Perfect. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> great. <laughs> we can teach you, which I, I, there are a lot of dealerships that do very well at, teaching sales individuals and it did kind of go away during COVID because COVID it's like, Oh, we have the car. We're the only dealership with the car. Yeah. Do you want this car? Okay. This is the price. Oh my And gosh. it took kind of all the negotiating power out of it, which one, a lot of times if a, a dealership should price it fair, so it shouldn't need to be negotiated, but now it's going back into figuring out people's wants, needs and, kind of leading in the, in the direction of like, Hey, we have 12 vehicles that all fit your price point. Like, let's figure out which one's right for you. Yeah. So I, I do feel like that's kind of happening in the house market too, where it's like, Hey, now there are a few houses that are in your budget. And then you figure out the wants and needs to guide them to what's going to make them the most happy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you nailed it. Inventory is, uh, creeping up for the time being. Um, Gosh, when I started, we used to be able to go look at, let's just say I had an out of town buyer coming in and, and they wanted to see, you know, what, what a good fit for them was. Usually we'd have a pool of about 30 properties we could go look at. Um, and then, I mean, late 2020, 2021, that dropped to like two or three a day. And you're writing offers basically on all of them, uh, selling your soul, you know, waving inspections, waving appraisal, going 50 grand over list price. Um, borrowing a cash gift to cover an appraisal gap, which is just essentially setting money on fire. 
Um, so yeah, you nailed it. We're heading back into a healthier market and clients uh, certainly have more of an opportunity to find something that fits them. Which I think 2020 is the first time it's like really ever happened. At least if you kind of look back in time. I don't know if 08, 09 it was like that, just with like very wealthy individuals being capable of just buying up everyone else. No, like so 08, like there was an influx of inventory in auto space and homes, everything. There was an influx of everything. It's like, I feel like 2020 was the first time in the history of the auto space, at least. I think the, the housing market that inventory became more valuable than clients that dealers didn't have like they didn't have to sell like homes like like you said you put it in a, on the market you a monkey could sell a house yeah in 2020 you didn't need to market you didn't need to do that stuff and that's no. like i had the conversation with madison like during those times i was like this is when you take market share and it was like those times where she was getting these listings it was crazy how many agents like she was doing videos on him she was doing all this marketing stuff she was doing everything that she was supposed to do every single time. Everyone's like, why are you doing all that? They're going to sell. But she's like, I told her, I'm like, you build a process and you do it every single time. Every time. I'm like, somebody shouldn't get short changed just because they have a house that should sell. I was like, for all you know, everything that you did got them extra 20 grand. Yep. I was like, but you do that every time. And then they refer you to the next person because like, this is how they do it. Yep. And I'm like, don't take the shortcuts just because the shortcuts available. Right. No. And, and, and look at where she's at now. Yeah. I mean, extremely successful, has a great business. But it's the same thing with you. Like, I guarantee you, like, I see where your business is and I can tell how you did business at that time. The people now that are shining, you can go back two, three years. They don't need to tell me now how they did business then. Right. I know you did business the right way at that time because now look at your business. But that's playing ahead of yourself saying, hey, I'm hedging my future right now. Yep. Instead of being like, okay, I'm going to shortchange all these clients. It's a quick buck. Yep. Make all as the, much profit as I can. Cut my listing expenses. Yeah. All the things. All the agents that did that, look at where they're sitting now. Like, shit, I can't get work now. Market's trash. It's falling off, falling on its face. I'm like, I know a lot of agents putting up the biggest year right now that they ever have. I think agents saw the effect of that. Like the ones who didn't do it properly saw the effect of that last year when rates, you know, really jumped up <clears throat> and even in into the first and second quarter of this year, we follow broker metrics, which basically tracks everybody's business in our MLS as long as they record and close out the sale properly. Um, and I mean, even some really recognizable names that, I mean, you'd just be shocked if you saw where their numbers were today and at the end of last year compared to like 2018, 2019, 2020. Um, and I mean, like you said, if, if they would have just continued their process of extremely high service, um, you know, treating every client the way they should, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, and, and we've certainly seen a lot of growth. We've we've grown every year. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people took a dip after that huge boom. And, um, and and luckily we didn't. We continued to grow. So and I think it's a lot of times you see people change their business so fast to whatever is happening economic wise they change their processes they change like like you said the service side realistically like that's where i saw dealers were probably the worst at it yeah. dealers pulled back like everything to cut get marketing like, well they just cut back like all the the little things that they did for people like i was talking on the phone with somebody when i came in that I was talking about like just doing the smallest things right all the time. Like right now we're having a pallet of water delivered that has like our logos on and everything. And like, it's from the, the second they walk in, I think about their experience from like, uh, you can ask Dre, like I'm an OCD on the type of water that's bought. Yep. Like I'm OCD about every part of that experience, but it's like, I have a, we have a good friend that is friends with all of us that owns Northwestern Mutual in Kansas City. And like when you go in there and you sit in his lobby, like it has like high end tea, it has sparkling water, it has, still water it's all like high level stuff the experience from the second you meet the receptionist till what you get to drink till you go to the office till you get done like the service is different yep and it's just like i look at that in real estate in the auto space and a lot of these like just crazy high volume sale markets they try to just nixate all that stuff to 
what they are thinking is elevating to get the most profit is actually what's shooting them in the foot the quickest. Yeah, for sure. I mean, people don't usually remember the logistics of the transaction or the bumps in the road. They, I mean, they just remember how you made them feel, what was their experience like? And and that's what they go tell everybody about. So, yeah. But also, I think it's the way your outlook is, is one thing you said was the market's getting healthier. Mm -hmm. Like your outlook just on that of people, I know a lot of agents where the market's just horrible, but that's their outlook. And you're like, it's a healthy market like yeah. it's, and it's getting healthier. Yeah. So just that one thing changes your thought process on how you do everything within each transaction. Oh, certainly. And I mean, to your point, that's really the entire reason that we moved out of our brokerage office up to our own satellite office in Smithville, where only our team works out of is just because there's so much negativity. And I mean, the people who are negative are, are just so much louder than the people who are positive and you get sucked into it and there's gossip and all sorts of bad stuff. And I mean, we made that move pretty early on after I started and immediately culture shifted, outlook shifted, mindset shifted. And I mean, it, it was one of the best moves we've ever made for sure. And now we're just surrounded with outpouring positivity and problem solving. And it's just, it's, it's awesome. So, and that's, I don't know Eric at all. Never met him. Couldn't pick him out of a crowd. Yeah. But I have respect for him. Yeah. And the fact that he has helped develop somebody like you into what you do to have all those right characteristics. That's rare in the space today to where it's like having, having something like that, understanding energy levels, understanding to, Hey, move out of this office, make this play that at that time, him moving out to your guys' own offices, that was a big expense that most. Yeah. And he fronted you know, it. Yeah. I mean, it was his money. He, yeah. and he had to, he ripped the building down to the studs and, and made it extremely nice. Uh, and, and he didn't have to, Yeah, he didn't have to do it, but to your point, he was looking ahead. He, he, he made a play for the future and it paid off. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So no, I think that's crazy cool to see that that like, I like seeing the backside when it all starts panning out. When people make those moves in the beginning that everyone's like, oh, that wasn't the right move. And like all those negative people are like, they're stupid. That They probably were saying that. For, for sure. They're yeah. Like, yeah. Spending all this money at this time, like no way. Like, I've never even thought about that. How many that. years ago was so that right. when he did that? Uh, we moved in 2019 sometime. Oh, they're like, dude, country's about to shut down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Next we're recession's coming. Yeah, we're, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's fucked. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, I also look at it as like, I truly believe that you create your own destiny in everything that you do. That there was a time in 08 that people looked at it, that 08, a lot of people went broke, but 08 also made a lot of millionaires. Oh my God. There's so many people that I know that when you, there's people who've been on here and you ask them about their story and they're like, where we became rich was 08. Yeah. It was because they thought about it as like, yeah. that was an opportunity grab. Like, yeah, when everyone, themselves went to work. Yeah, but it's they, like, they risked everything like during and they're like, like everyone's already losing everything. I, I would just be one more if I lost it. And yeah. then they're like, where they're at now, I'm like, what a gamble. Yeah, too bad I was in like eighth grade. That would have been a really good time. <laughs> I should have been buying Bitcoin back then. Yeah. Man. Yeah, I was, I was doing algebra tests when I should have been buying real estate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you, you look at these people that bet at those times that like most people just aren't willing to make the bet, which I mean, is it always fun to do? Not in the moment, but it's like you look at the backside of it that it's hard doing that at that time when no one else is, because I think so many people look for this verification or this like, I don't know, somebody saying that it's OK. Mm hmm. That there was like moves that validation. I'm, validation. There we go. That was where I was looking for. But solid input there. Yeah, thank you, Dre. I'm not always I'm I not you. I'm not gonna say I'm always the best with words. I've never <laughs> never claimed that. I say but, the wrong word half the time, so yeah. it's fine. Um but I look as like they're always looking for somebody to tell them that's okay. Yeah. And there was points I was making moves that like literally every single person was telling me, like, don't do that. Yeah, they, and I'm like they want certainty. Yeah. 
you know, and it's c- like, comfy little blanket of this is all going to be okay. And that's not how it works. No. And there's a guy I know that has a two car lots, older guy has all his stuff. And he's like, he, in 08, he went and leveraged every single dollar he'd made his whole entire life to buy just real estate galore. Like when everything was going down and he's like, my banker literally told me, he's like, you've lost your mind, dude. He goes, you're gonna lose every single dollar that you have. And he's like, my family stopped talking to him. He was like, his kids were pissed. They're like, he's, he pulled out, he had 401k and stuff. He'd worked this hourly job his whole life. And it was, I think he owns half a town now. Yeah. Now he's like, <laughs> he owns so much stuff. He has so much money. He doesn't even know what to do with it, but he just bought real estate. Like, and he, I think after 08, four years later, he owned 120 properties and had over a hundred, over a hundred of them free and clear. Oh my gosh. And had done all this stuff. And now he's, he's liquidated all of his real estate stuff. And now he sold just, it during the boom. He's like, it went up and then he just liquidated all of it in like 2020, like the highest point. And yep. then he was like, now he just sits back. <laughs> See you <laughs> just, later. Yeah. Now he just buys all these cars and stuff. Just does it for fun. Doesn't care if he sells cars. Like, but it's cool to see like somebody like that when everyone told him it was wrong play. Mm-hmm. But now they look at it as like, you know, that was a good play, bro. Yeah. I bet they talked to him now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, how'd you do it? Yeah. Just did everything that everybody told me not to do. <laughs> yeah. So, but, and I'm not saying that always pans out on the right side for people either. Certainly There's not. a lot of people that do that. And definitely yeah, normally, so. normally that's what happens. Yeah. Just nobody hears about that down the road. Yeah. yeah. Those aren't the stories that people talk about. Uh-uh. You know, yeah. so and so is broke. He's broke, happen. broke. That's like when you see that person on Instagram that always wins the lottery yeah. on like the slot machine. And then you go and you lose all your money. It's like, dude, that wasn't as fun as it looked. <laughs> no. Yeah. But. So at what point you during your real estate here? career did you get into bourbon and cigars? Uh, I yeah. guess they kind of go hand in hand, don't they? I, I mean, I would think so. But I would have to disagree. <laughs> Ray doesn't like bourbon. Weirdo. I, you don't sell real estate. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's I feel like a very I'm, I'm, valid point. I feel like I'm the perfect real estate agent over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you should consider it. Yeah. Uh, man, uh, when I was 18, my dad and his buddy got me into cigars. Uh, so I, you know, had liked cigars since then. Um, and then bourbon, uh, my brother-in-law is real big into bourbon. He actually just lives down the road and, uh, he sort of forced me into it. I didn't really enjoy it at first. Uh, that's the spirit. I mean, I'll tell you what though. It's a hard, you it's get, a hard push to get in. Sometimes yeah, you get into some of the high end stuff though. I don't care who you are. You're going to like it. I yeah. mean, you say that I I've, I've poured Dry some pretty high in bottles and you know, you know, it pairs real nice with it. A little bit of Coke. Okay. <laughs> yeah. To, to get it down. Yeah. I'm like, mm. he's done that with stag junior. Oh God. No, that was Sprite. That hurts me. It was yeah. like Dane, Dane went on a kick every time he would, uh, close an account and he'd go buy like a nice bottle of whiskey. Well, it happened. When we've like really started like getting a little bit of traction in the basement. We're like, okay, we're like close some accounts. And like, and it was uh, Ricky and Lauren just started. Like we actually like had some manpower like mm-hmm. for the first time. And I'm like, and Ricky doesn't even drink. Yeah, Ricky doesn't drink. <laughs> Ricky's never had drink of alcohol or a sip of alcohol so. ever. It's true. Yeah, ever. I'm actually kind of jealous of it. I know. I kind of want to go back because yeah. I, I, I mean, that's, that's like, like yeah, yeah. Probably so much fitter. Than yeah, this. it's <laughs> probably a lot easier to just never start. Yeah, yeah. yeah don't. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Yeah. So Slippery that's what you have. When everyone was okay. peer pressuring you, you said no. Smart. Yeah, and then you kind of just make it out of that window. And yeah. Like, now he's like, I'm fine. It's and now like, it's starting to be a cool thing. Again. It's a yeah. super cool thing now. <laughs> yeah. It's trendy. Ricky's, this is like, a, a, Ricky's like the coolest now. <laughs> yeah. Crew Mahoney or some guy like that on Instagram. Guy like runs a mile every day. Sounds like a cool name. Like 2,000 <laughs> days in a row he's done it and he doesn't drink either. Never had a How could you? A mile every day? I don't know. Yeah, if I boost all night and I had to go run a mile more, I'm thinking, I think it's going to lie. Where's Dayton? He's laying in the driveway. Yeah. I don't yeah. think you made it out of the driveway. Yeah. We, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't run a mile last Thursday morning, did we? Uh, no. <laughs> I come in the office, are you like, shit? I'm like, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, appreciate that. I feel like shit, too. Yeah. Didn't wake up at 3.30 yeah, that day. I did day. not see the story go up. No. I but, looked for it, too. I was like, I wonder. I really thought about it. I was like. It's just like, out the window. Yeah, you yeah. could have just walked out, done Did it, and then we walked out. Right <laughs> hey, how do we know he doesn't do that? Yeah, that's uh, true, dude. dude I will is say, Instagram a lie. <laughs> Instagram's all a lie. No, this just morning, old photos. So <laughs> the, the funny thing was this morning. I had cigars last night with 
the new guys. And I've always looked at that as like the three thirty in the morning thing. I like it for myself. It motivates me a lot, mm-hmm. but it's also I look at it as like a competitor in the space. Yep. That's like, I want people to know who they're competing against. And it's, I, this morning I got up at three o'clock and I'm staying in my bathroom. I'm like, I went to sleep at like 10 30, 11 last yeah, night. Dude, you're halfway there. You're already out, already out of bed. I was bed. out of bed. I'm sitting, I had to leave from Manhattan at uh, 5 30. I was like, do I shoot over the gym, hit my story? I was like, work out, come back, drive to Manhattan. Then I had a, another appointment and, uh, what is that? What next afterwards? Yeah. Then I was back at the office, had multiple meetings at the office. And I was like, the one reason I didn't go this morning was because I had a podcast. Last week, I went 3 30 in the morning and that podcast that night. Our podcast last week kind of fucking sucked. I was <laughs> half asleep the whole time. Had a pretty low energy. Yeah. And Dane's yawning halfway through. I'm like, oh, we're going to make it to the end. Yeah. Ricky's looking at me. He's like, you good? I'm like, I think I yawned like probably 10 times on that podcast. Oh, we didn't no. make it real of it. Just be on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do the, uh, I'm an early riser as well, uh, but I, I do the same thing. I got to put my phone way far away from uh, me. I got to get up, got to get dressed, turn the alarm off. And at that point, I'm, you know, like, I'm, if I'm, I'm not looking to get hit every morning because I sleep like a rock. Dude, the thing and is, if the alarm goes off, Ben's like, wake up. And I just, I'd probably come with a black eye. Dude, the thing is, if you set your phone next to your bed, like if I set my alarm for 3 30 and I set one for 6 30 tomorrow. And I sat next to my bed. I would never know that that three thirty ever went off. I would probably snooze and not even remember even it, getting dude, up to do it. It happens so fast; it doesn't even make sense. I like. Oh, it's. I literally like. <laughs> I'll get up and I'm like, I look at Max. I'm like, Did you hear my alarm go off at three thirty? She's like, Yeah, you rolled over and turned it off. I was like, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. Like, but it's when when it's in the bathroom, you get up and you're like walking to the bathroom. I set a full water bottle next to my phone every single night. Oh, that's smart. I need to start and doing that. If it's in the bathroom, you go in there. I'll tell you the one way that like you're not going back to sleep is going and chuck a full bottle of water. Dude, how do you do that and then go work out? I feel like my body doesn't start processing anything for like water? the first hour. I, d- I chug a whole water. <laughs> do, you, do you drink pre-workout in the morning? Yeah. Yeah, see, if I drink Same. pre-workout and with like too much water... If I did I just, drink pre-workout, like, I don't think do. my workout would be worth anything. Yeah, you want a quick 300 milligrams of caffeine, you'll be awake. <laughs> yeah. So a little like... I, just how fast can yeah. you... Yeah, like yeah. Yeah, how fast can you jumpstart your body to get it going? <laughs> pretty it's, fast. Yeah. You put it's like the, putting jumper cables on. Yeah, pretty much. What you should do is you put the phone right there. You put the uh, blender bottle already has the pre-workout in. The bottle's there. Then you just dump it in there. And mm, so I've thought about doing straight that. Straight from the start. I actually <laughs> was doing that for like the first two months of the year. Yeah. I put my pre-workout. Really fell off the New Year's resolution, bud. Yeah, we'll try again next year. No, no uh, I put the pre-workout right next to a bottle with like maybe that much water in it, just so it's like two swigs. Oh. Uh, t- see, I think that's what I'm buying. You've got to process it. You've got weeks until the wedding, dude. You still have time. Weeks. Yeah. Weeks, weeks until yeah. the wedding. <laughs> no, it's just dry scoop it at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, just snort a f- whole line of pre-workout. Just have it all like lined up yeah. in there and just rail it. In yeah, there. yeah. I'm at the gym, nose bleeding. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> Nothing. Is it blue? <laughs> People are doing it. That's raspberry. <laughs> Sour <laughs> raspberry is great. I think I have heartburn right now. <laughs> no, I, I just think like I think getting up in the morning. That's something that I think uh, where real estate it is crazy. Where a lot of people like just don't work. No, and they don't run it like a job. They, yeah, they. I mean, you sh- you should be working as if you're employed. I mean, you're employing yourself. Would Would you ever hire somebody and be okay with them sleeping in until nine o'clock in the morning and coming into the office at eleven and yeah. then going to the gym at lunch and yeah, no. And then they wonder why they 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 don't get much business, right? And it's like, I think that's the craziest thing too. Is the the other thing that I've always looked at like those early morning like stories and things like that. You know how many people like apply to MMG and want to be a part of MMG b- because of that? I mean, I'm sure it's a lot. There's so many people they're like like oh you, you guys are like dialed in like like get after the, it. And they just it, it sets a different standard that there's people I know that I see those and like it irritates me if I get up and I go put that story on and I'm like getting in my truck in the morning and I'm like posting that and I'm like who has posted a story already this morning? I click it. I'm like, so it bothers me too. It does. Like, I mean, I, when I wake up, I, I used to do, I used to wake up at three fifty five and I'd get to the gym by four 30 and I'd do the same thing. And 
post, but then I saw you posting 350 and I was like, I'm not posting this anymore. <laughs> and I'm not getting up at 330. I'm, I just. But the thing is, like when I did the chasing the fours for quite a while, I like think it, I think it was Steven who came on and Dan's it was like, bro. That was that he was like, it was one of those things I was chasing the fours every day. So I'd make sure that every day I was leaving before 444. Yep. And I knew if I set my alarm at 415, I did my whole routine, I would be out and I could have my story posted before 445. Mm -hmm. So I was like, so I was chasing the fours. I came out here to sneeze and then went away. Uh, I was like, Ricky, Ricky's out. Ricky's yeah, gone. See Ricky's yeah. out. <laughs> no. But it was like, I was chasing the fours for a while and then we had Stephen McBee on the podcast and every day I go to post that and he's like 3.30 in the morning. He's like, already at the gym. Guy's a machine. I'm like, dude. And if uh, after... After Madison and I got married, I was like, I got to turn up the internal alarm clock. Yep. And I was like, I focused on getting to bed earlier. So I was like, what do I have to change in the evening time? And I will say the the only thing that dictates if I can make that happen or not is my evening routine. Same. That is 100% it. Like if, I, if my evening routine is dialed in, yep. I have no problem with it at 3.30 in the morning. Same. But when I fall off the rails on my evening, like that is what actually dictates the whole morning. How I kickstart my day is what I did the day before. Take yeah. us through and your, it, take us through your guys's perfect evening routine. Well, you have a child, so you're just <laughs> yours has got to be different. I would, yeah, I it has to be different than mine. It's a little bit different. <laughs> Luckily, I mean, she's still young, so she goes to bed anywhere between six thirty and seven thirty at night, depending on you know how the day has gone, what time she woke up from her nap, all that fun stuff. Um, and so then usually I'll, I mean, I'll get home from work, hang out with her, get her to bed, usually knock out a little bit more work until 830. And then I try to put the phone and all the electronics away and just uh, let my brain unwind. I usually get in bed either a little before nine or at nine and the phone goes in the bathroom and I'm asleep in like five minutes. I mean, and if I'm asleep before 930, I will wake up before my alarm every day. Yeah, it's. I will say probably one of the biggest hacks I changed that like made my mornings different was putting my phone in the bathroom. Yep. I think that's probably the worst thing for I'm talking relationship. I'm talking for just everything is having phones in the bedroom. Horrible. Didn't like, you used to have a math? Dude, I tried Ricky's yeah. math thing once <laughs> and I was like, I, I download it. We have to solve the yeah. problem yeah. Dude, to turn it off. Oh, Dude. Horrible. Yeah. My brain is not kickstarted enough because I'm looking at the night. Why I'm am I doing long division at 3 a.m.? Well, I can't at, even see, man. Yeah. I'm like, stop. I'm really looking at it. I'm like, easy is way too easy. I'm like, medium, pretty easy. I was like, hard. I was like, I go extra hard. I was like, I'm pretty decent at math. Next morning, I'm in the bathroom. My phone's going off and it's like five minutes. Yeah, you're just <laughs> like, staring at it. Trying to no figure idea. it out. I'm like, out of time on that one. Then it like restarts another problem. And I'm like, and Madison finally walks in. She's like, turn off your fucking phone. I was like, I can't. I, I can't, can't figure out this problem. Can you problem. solve this problem? <laughs> so I had, to, I had to taper down the, the math uh, skill level on that. Dan's getting the gym just ready to go. Just already mad. Oh, Didn't dude. even need the pre-workout. Alarm's level. still going off in his AirPods. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you still do that? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I reinstalled it the other day. Yeah. So it's I'll get, tough. I'll have like a really easy time getting up. And then if something like, whether it's a vacation or whatever, if I get off the groove of getting up early, mm -hmm. it's a wreck. It's hard. I think it's, it's a hard, so hard to get back into it. When you derail it, it like. Yeah, it feels like it's not even a possibility some mornings. And then yeah. as soon as it's a habit, it's second nature. My deal too, though, is like, if I don't win the evening before, like last night, I did not win my evening. So it's like, I knew I had to be. And now it's like, I look at like 5, 5.30 is like not early. No. So I look at uh -huh. now, it's like, I have to be out of the house, be on the yeah. road by 5.30. And so I'm like, not even early morning for me. So I'm like, I'm going to sleep in till five. And now it's like, I'm sleeping in till five. And I'm like, I'm sitting there thinking about getting up at three. Like this, this morning when I'm up at three, it's just, I knew with the podcast, it wasn't, my cards weren't going to play out right for the day. It's just a wave of guilt too. It is all day. I feel like I feel a like piece a, of shit the rest of the day if I don't get up and, and get after it. Yeah, it is. Same. <laughs> same. Sorry. It's so crazy. <laughs> Trail come I have day, six like, alarms set. <laughs> hey, some people are different. You can yeah. get up whenever you want. I do get that. After. I hit snooze for about yeah. six times and I'm like, oh, ready to go. Dude, yeah, but it's like. I'm not as productive. We've also, know. we've had people like have worked for us so that they can't figure out how to get to work by 9.15. Or like by nine. Hey, am I am I ever late? No, but that's I, what I'm saying. I'm never. There's late some people that like I, I make they sure. could not get there at nine if their life depended on. It. That's crazy. and they come in they're like, 
I'm like, I'm ready like, for did lunch. You, did you just ride a bed? I'm like, I've eaten twice already today. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. I think that was one of my biggest issues when I was going to the gym. I'd get back, have my post workout, I'd have protein, uh, yogurt. And then by the time I get to the office, I'm eating my second meal for the day. And then lunch, third meal. And then I'm mm-hmm. having a snack and then eating again that night. I'm like, I went from eating like twice a day to five times a day. I'm like, I feel like I'm eating way more. It's because your body's actually operating like the way it's supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're not meant just to be these like slugs that just blah. blah, blah. You, you, call, you call me a slug? <laughs> <laughs> I think you just You're call a me a slug. that you sleeps just in. Me a slug. Yeah, you got targeted. <laughs> Don't be a slug. I have started. I, I do set my alarms for about. 6.50 is the earliest. At least what it's is, before 7. What is the like 9.15 alarm? On Mondays? Yeah. Uh, go over reporting. Okay. So well, that we're one, always still doing something. It's, it's a it's, siren. Dude, so that <laughs> every, one goes off. Wow. Every one Monday we're like. Every Monday it's 9.20. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was close. It goes I off at close. 9.20 and that dude. just reminds me I need to go over reporting. <laughs> because if I set a reminder, now I just have so many notifications on my phone. I just don't know how to delete them. That was just a mess. Yeah. It, and so now if that doesn't go off, I just don't check it. So I used to, like, I'd talk to my phone, be like, set a reminder for like three o'clock or whatever. And then I, it'll go off and then it gets shoveled in with all the other notifications. So I'm like, I would just miss it. Yep. So now if it's important, I set an alarm. I ain't missing that. That's well, true. Dre all the time, he's like notorious for it now. Where we'll be sitting in a meeting, we're going over something, we're having like a serious time. And it's like, bro, bro, bro. I'm like, <laughs> What time to get up, bud? Yeah, like, wake up. That's the only time I hear that noise is when I get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> I but. hear it throughout my day. <laughs> what, what kind of fueled you to? I'm always in, interested in like what fuels somebody to do that, like to get I, up in the morning. Well, I'm just saying like all of it, like the motivation that comes with it. Like I think that's it. It's a unique characteristic that not a, a lot of majority of people don't have. It's the exact same thing as you mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm extremely competitive. Um, And so when I look at other people in the industry or other people, even in my office, um, not from like a negative or confrontational standpoint, but uh, I just want to, I just want to win at everything, not just, you know, how many houses did you sell? How many families did you help? But what time did you get up? How fast do you walk? You know, ev- everything. Um, and so Eric and Andrea, basically immediately after I started, Andrea is like, hey, what time do you wake up in the morning? And luckily, I mean, I was waking up at 3.30 to go train. Um, but I quickly fell out of that and started sleeping in and waking up at, you know, 7, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you slug. And you. She, she's like, I'm calling you every morning at 5:30, and I was like, Well, shit, she's waking up at 5:30. Like, I want to wake up at five. Well, now she wakes up at four, and I wake up at you know 4:45. So it's just it's just a competition thing for me. Um, and um, I I like being awake when the majority of the world's asleep, and just knowing that I can widen the gap during that time. Um. I hope that doesn't come off like negative or self-centered. But no, I, I a hundred percent, like when you go to the gym in the morning, I I'm felt the targeted. First. Yeah. <laughs> I felt targeted. Did I offend you? Yeah. I am offended right now. <laughs> but I don't think there's anything cooler than when you roll up to the gym at three forty-five in the morning and I'm the first car there besides the person that works there. Yep. Besides the person working the front desk, I'll pull in, I'm back in my truck and I'm the only vehicle there. Yeah. I work out at uh, the clubhouse up at Staley. And I'm usually the only one in there. I yeah. love it. I mean. So I like when all these other people that are getting up, like they think they're getting up early at like 5.30, 6 to get to the gym. And I'm finishing working out. And yeah. they're like rolling in. They're like, dude, what time did you get here? I'm like, I'm heading to the office now. Different level. And it's just like, I look at that as, I th- once again, it's a competitor spirit. Like it, it's just understanding like what it takes to win. And I think too many people just take it for granted. And I mean, there's also like Alex Mosey talks about, he's like, you don't need some, like you need to understand to work all the time, be hard, like what you do. He's like, there's not some set morning ritual. that's going to make you rich that there's yeah. a lot of people I know that get up really early. that are still broke as shit. So it's like, and haven't figured out business, whatever it's piecing all of it together. Yeah. So it's like, it's also a fight with myself. Yeah. That it's like, you got to quit negotiating with yourself. Yeah. I mean, keep the, keep the promises you make to yourself and, 
I mean, that builds confidence and, yeah. um, I was going to go somewhere with that. Uh, oh, I think, uh, I mean, also, I mean, all the other benefits that have come from that, I mean, I'm fully functioning by the time I get out of the gym. So if I'm hopping on emails or I'm running comps or I'm getting ready for an appointment, I mean, I've, it's the middle of the day for me, you know, at, at, you know, 9.00 AM. Um, so I think I am able to service my business at a higher level because of it too. There are just a lot of positive, um, you know, side effects of, of doing that. So I, I really enjoy it, but yeah, I, I do. I, I do agree with that a hundred percent because I do know when I do get up around six, six, <laughs> uh, sleeping in slug. Yeah. Slugging it. Uh, by the time, usually if I do start getting phone calls, it'd be around seven, mm-hmm. seven thirty. Um, very rarely does it happen, but if it does and someone has to do something, it's like, if you answer the phone around, right you wake up, that's you, the worst. your man. brain is not operating. And people you, know. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, <laughs> you're like trying to gather yourself real quick. Yeah. It never works. It's I've like, just gotten to where if somebody calls me, I was like, I'm not answering it. <laughs> it's like in five seconds, how fast can I get prepped for this? Yeah. Come on. And then you're like. Uh, this is Dre. How may I help you? <laughs> yeah, no, are you sleeping? How the fuck do you know? <laughs> Sorry, did I wake you up? Yeah. You're, as you're laying down in the pillow. <laughs> yeah. No, I just hopped out of the shower. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. No, it's... I, I also think it's just, like you said, keeping those promises to yourself. I think that's a characteristic that you have to have for just successful people. Mm-hmm. That I don't care what it is. And it's... If you do that over and over and over and over, like, I look at it with the podcast. Like, this is something that... I mean, we've done it for... Oh. This is the hundred and nineteenth time. Congratulations! Yeah. It's my favorite lucky number, number one nineteen. Yeah. That's a great yeah. number. That's my why we brought. Now that's why we brought you on. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. It's the little things. Guys but, do your research. We do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I look at like how crazy that is by itself. Like that's just awesome. For a hundred nine hundred nineteen weeks, we've dropped a podcast every single week, and we talk about it now. Ricky and I do all the time. We'll, we'll like talk about something. We're like, we have to make sure like we're really sure about it mm-hmm. because it's just something we have to like, do. Yeah, forever. like we we talked about the talker yeah, reviews and it. then we did the first one and now we're still doing talker reviews. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's an inconvenience. Probably now. 85 weeks in or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I look forward yeah. to the taco reviews. So Dan, they're, they're great. Dan yeah. says inconvenience, but he's the only one eating tacos every week now. I'm like, yeah, that sucks, dude. <laughs> yeah, really <laughs> inconvenient. <laughs> Man, <laughs> the oh, horrible. Well, we have so many people now. That over half of it is just people saying scores like, well, this is fucking. Boring. We we talk yeah. about playing ahead and playing the long game pretty often but for some reason we just have not figured out how to do that with the talker reviews so it's like the talker reviews <laughs> and the podcast like things that drop every week we are not good with that it's like, like we so we'll do you just like pick a place 15 minutes before you go no, well, so like, not that it's the, like we're only no, doing yeah, one a week. much right like instead of like we could do and sometimes that happens too. most times like tuesday oh. and then they'll come and i'm like dude sushi sounds good and like you got to do a talk review like I thought you were talking about the podcast. I was like, well, we know what guests is going on. We have gotten better about that. Yes. But yeah, the tacos, it's like, oh yeah, today is Tuesday. It's one o'clock. Dane needs to go eat some tacos. (laughs) You better eat some tacos. So that then I make it edit it (laughs) and I can post it at like nine o'clock tonight. Yeah. Oh my God. So it's, we did message one of our clients the other day. Uh, He does very well in the meat industry. And he's sitting there and Lauren texts him. He's like, She's like, hey, you want to be on the podcast? He's like, oh, you're getting desperate. <laughs> <laughs> but you you have to know the individual. Like, yeah. He didn't mean it. He's, in a pretty, bad way. he's pretty funny. It's like, man, you're really reaching now. <laughs> That's hilarious. But it, it's just probably the first 75 podcasts, like, we would figure it out. Like, half of them were filmed and edited. Like, we'd film them on Thursday or Dude, Friday. It was Thursday or Friday, like, almost every time. We wouldn't even think about it till like, Wednesday. And we're just all like, Texting everyone like, dude, do you get somebody? You get like somebody. Oh, now we got two. Well, we can only do one. Yeah. So it's like. You think we could do one Thursday and then Friday night and then we could push that. And then Ricky's over here. He was editing it all. He's like, dude, come on. Really? Yes. I don't have anything to do this weekend in school. (laughs) (laughs) That was before Autopod. Yeah. We were a complete disaster for the podcast for a long time. And now it's more structured. Yeah. We figured out Ricky, uh, came on he's like oh you guys don't like really mess with much audio or you don't need audio for anything <laughs> and then uh then after we figured out ricky's a uh, pretty solid audio uh let's do a podcast we're, yeah, <laughs> we're, what about podcast. a podcast and then uh here we are 119 weeks later yeah there you go which come yeah. to find out was a good move yeah we got <laughs> roasted for like the first i mean probably 25 30 of them 
If anyone wants well, to go laugh and yeah. you've made oh. it this far, go back to yeah, people. Had, well, it's not like we didn't intro. deserve it. Let's, they weren't very good, paint, so I'm not going to dis- a different picture. People would get on there and like, anyone can have a podcast in these days. Apparently, I'm like, <laughs> that's yeah. true. Like you could, yeah, sure. Yeah, buy some mics and stuff. To have at it. <laughs> like people yeah. today, anyone can sell a podcast. Yeah. yeah, rock on, go for it. The hardest part is just being consistent with it, making <laughs> it through all the negative hate to get up there. <laughs> Same with but, anything. Yeah. <laughs> Consistency. But, no, I very much appreciate you coming on. Hey, and I knew that was going to be crazy easy to talk with you on here. So. <laughs> <laughs> knew that was going to be a problem. Uh, any final thoughts? Anything like that? Uh, I mean, I, I just appreciate you guys having me on here. You've got a good thing rolling. So uh, getting to be a small part of that for an hour is pretty cool. And I'm grateful for it. Yeah. If anyone watching, if you're in the market for real estate, this dude's solid. And thank you. Uh, I'll back them on that. So um, we'll put all the links and everything to all, all of your social platforms, everything like that underneath. Cool. Appreciate website. It. And uh, once again, thank you for being on. My pleasure. Thank you guys. Any final thoughts, Dre, Ricky? I didn't even know if you're going to ask us for our final thoughts, but no, see, I, see I circled back around to that. <laughs> did. I didn't did. forget about you guys, but Ricky. No, appreciate you being on. Hey, my he pleasure. got hyped thank there you. for a second. He, he, was, was he like, faked me out. Yeah. But, fake. All right. Cool. Cool. That's M3 podcast. Peace. See you guys. Thanks for listening to the M3 podcast. podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Want to learn more? Check us out on Instagram at Moss Marketing Group, on Facebook at Moss Marketing 58, or on our website at mossmarketinggroup.com.